Hey, thank you so much for joining us at our Cross Point Church podcast. Now, if you're new to our podcast or maybe new to our church in general, we're just a bunch of messed up people who don't have it all together, running after a heavenly leader who loves us and meets us right where we are. We hope this message encourages you, builds your faith, and strengthens your confidence as you continue down this journey of what it means to know and follow Jesus. Enjoy this message. Well, you could focus on this. Now, you are currently enrolled at the University of Phoenix online. Indeed. Damn yes, right we, we are. are. Damn it's, right we uh, are. It's the oldest institution of its kind, and as such, many people refer to it as the Harvard of Internet colleges. Oh, I, I hadn't heard that. No, that, that has not made it out here, that reputation. Well, we're Phoenix that. proud. We're Phoenix proud. Well, that's fine. Um, we're going to ask you a few questions that some of our candidates find a little bit odd. Let's get No weird. judgment. Shoot. You're shrunken down to the size of nickels and dropped to the bottom of a blender. What do you do? It, is there anything else in the blender? Uh, I don't know. Well, that's going to make a difference. Yes, Are there yes, ice cubes yes, to yes. climb on? Are we working with a daiquiri Are here? Are we making a, a smoothie? In. It's been a long week. Maybe we want to let these little guys live a little. <laughs> okay, uh, for the sake of the argument, let's say it's empty. Sure. Well, in that case, it's easy then. Yeah. Why? I'm sorry? The first work down to the size of a nickel and there's no liquid in the blender, we go ahead and put on our back. So you take her flat on your right, back right, like right. this. Right, right, right. You just lay back, enjoy that breeze. Feather, Pretend it's a fan. And let the, the okay, blades whip all, all, all around you like this. It's like getting an MRI. Once this blender's on, it's on forever. It's on forever. Respectfully, I got to disagree. We sold blenders, and even the best model in the world is only going to run nonstop for even what? Even the Billy? Germans. The yeah. Germans could never. Even the German model, even one of those brown ones, only going to run for maybe 10 or 11 hours. So we're getting out, and when we do, we're better off for it because whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, let's just go ahead and big picture this for a second, if I can. Just like the founders of Google, big pictured Googling, it's not so much getting out of the blender, it's what happens next. That's the question. You've got two nickel-sized men free in the world. Think of the possibilities. I mean, I, I, I'm top of my head and I'm just my before here. swimming. Sunglass repair? We'd yeah, be yeah, hell on those little screws. Little, or maybe stick us in those submarines that they put in people's bodies to fight diseases. That's cutting edge right okay, there. Okay, that's, that's not a real thing, the submarines. No. Wait a minute. I thought we were stuck in a blender. Now we're saving lives? What? Uh, what? 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 Let me just recap this for you real quick. We start off in a blender. Yeah. Now we're saving lives. What? 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 Wait a minute, we were stuck in a blender, a and now we're saving lives? What? You guys led us to this, thank you. I think we've gotten a little far afield. Just a little off topic. Allie, I'll get inside you and I'll fight for you. Oh, thank you. Which I, one I of appreciate you, that. But... Which one of you is physics? Mr. Campbell, you could maybe expound on this from a physics aspect. Physics? Here, here. Listen, the... I could bend your ear about physics and various physical phenomenon, but the truth is we were in a blender. We lost our jobs, we'd given up. So I think we already answered the question when we took this interview. We got ourselves out, and here we are. If you guys really want to know what happens when you take two guys out of a blender, I'm sorry, Allison, is it? Yes. Then give us a shot. And I think you'd be happy that you did. Oh, man. Any internship fans out there tonight? Oh, man. I tell you what, what a great, great movie. And if you're not familiar with this, uh, Vince Vaughn and uh, Owen Wilson there, Nikki and Billy, they lose their jobs and they kind of got to reinvent themselves and they apply to be interns to kind of go backwards into an internship at Google. And as you can see right there, I mean, you know, it kind of captures kind of the tensions of our world today. Some of the stresses of, of how do we make it? How do we actually build and develop our lives? And we're going to look at that this weekend as we uh, talk in part two of our series here, Fight For. What does it look like to fight for the next generation, to fight for the, you know, the generation that's up and coming that is going to be, you know, a part of shaping our world over the next upcoming uh, years and even decades. And so, man, super excited you're here with us this weekend. My name's Kerr, and if you're here for the first time, uh, so excited you're here, whether you're in person, tuning in online. Uh, it's a great time to be connecting with us here at Cross Point at the beginning of a brand new series. And uh, let's make some noise also for those joining us online this weekend. So excited to have you join us on the other side of the screen and uh, that you take the time to be with us this weekend. Now, um, we're going to have fun today um, just looking at what does it look like to, to raise up, to build the next generation. We've all been in that place uh, where we've been that generation. And so um, we're going to look at another scene from this movie because this really kind of captures a, a bit of the heartbeat of, of I think, what we want to go after, this idea of when we experience difficult things, when we, you know, kind of get down on our luck, when, when perhaps, you know, the job fades away or the opportunity 
opportunities that we were planning on just, just kind of fade away. Um, what, what does it look like to fight for it in those moments? And as we can see in this next scene, um, these guys fight for it and it begins to pay off for them. So take a look at this. So who is our next applicant? Ah, our two Dacity men. So what are we thinking? Dana? You're kidding, right? No. Eleanor? Mm, they seem like really nice guys, but I, I don't think so. Okay, moving on. Oh, can I say something? You can, you will. We will resent you for wasting our time, but please don't let that stop you. It's just diversity is in our DNA, right? I thought the goal here was to find people with a different way of thinking. There's plenty of people with a different way of thinking. It doesn't mean that we have to hire them. Very good point, Dana. Moving on. I'm sorry, but you read their resumes, right? They have more years of sales and life experience than the age of most of our interns. Not to mention, our final judgment is always based on the layover test, right? Who would you rather be stuck next to at an airport bar for a six hour delay? The 10 millionth kid who knows that if you shrink, your strength to weight ratio allows you to jump way higher, duh. Or the out of the box thinkers who turn being stuck in a blender into an advantage. That's what I want us to talk about this weekend. What does it look like to raise a generation that turns a disadvantage into an advantage? And, you know, to, to actually be able to create a future, to have the kind of grit, to, to have the kind of ability and the belief in themselves that they can actually overcome anything that comes their way. And so that, that's what we're going to kind of fight for this weekend. And so uh, today, what I want us to see is that we all have a role to play in this. So whether you're a parent or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt or uh, a friend of someone who is in the up and coming generation, maybe uh, you're a educator, maybe you're an employ employer and you're hiring and, and shaping the next generation. Whatever your role is, which I think, believe, believe it or not, includes all of us, um, I, I want us to see that we have a role to play. And I'm not going to list all those roles out each and every time we kind of work through this, but I want us to see that we all have the ability to actually affect the next generation. So um, we're going to spend a little time kind of looking at the context of what the current up and coming generation is dealing with and what it means for us to fight for them. And then we're going to look at some of the things God says about this, which he gives us on a, kind of some real good clarity on how we raise uh, each generation up. And and then we're going to give some walkouts. I want to give some time to, to actually just give us some very tangible ways that we can put uh, practices we can put into place that actually build into this generation. Now, as we do this, we're going to look through the lens of one of my favorite, favorite uh, thought thinkers on this, uh, on the next generation, a guy by the name of Dr. Tim Elmore. Um, he, he's, a, he's somebody that I have actually had the chance to visit with. We've heard from him here at Crosspoint before. He's one of the best, uh, in my uh, belief, un, you know, people who understand like what this generation is looking looking at and what they're navigating, how we can build into them. And you can find his uh, work at growingleaders.com slash blog, which that never gets old. It's so fun right there. And uh, we're, we're going to look at some of the, the, just the data that he brings us. And one of the things that he uh, kind of brings to the forefront as we think about building the next generation is how there has been a, a kind of a change in the scorecard as we know it in terms of what it means to be a good parent. And so what he means by that is he said, you know, it used to be to be a good parent, it meant that you basically, you know, give your kids everything they need. But in today's world, you know, the, the, what, where we are kind of right now, and especially in our community, you're a good parent if you give your kids everything they want, right? And, and that may not be true in every community, and maybe that's not always true, but let's be honest, in Fisher's Quan, is that not true? Anybody? Yeah, okay. I got about six of you, <laughs> actually about 10 of you that, that are on board with that. And so... I think the dilemma when it comes to good parenting and, and raising this generation is that we wanna to try to remove hardship. And, and why wouldn't we? I mean, what good mom or good dad would not want their kids to not have to experience some of the hardships that we went through, and yet we have to be reminded that it was going through those things that are actually the things that forged and shaped who we are today. And so I want us to kind of change our thinking today as we think about what does it mean to raise up the next generation that we're not just raising up children, what we're doing is we're actually raising up future adults. Now, as we think about a little context on this, um, one of the big factors that each generation, all of us have had to do this, and, and today's current generation has to do this as well, we, they, they have to navigate the pace at which things change. And I think we would all agree that, that life changes at a pretty rapid pace, that there's a lot of chaos when it comes to navigating life. 
In fact, about 50 years ago, um, we began to learn that change brings stress. In fact, there were two doctors that developed an assessment, kind of an inventory called the social readjustment scale. And this kind of measured that if you have a certain amount of changes in your life, anything from moving to a new community or perhaps starting a new job or losing a job or you know, getting married or getting divorced or if you're a student, um, you know, graduating, going to a new community, going to college, developing new friendships, all of these things are life change units and they all, all add stress to our lives, whether, whether positive or negative. And so the big idea I want us to think about today is that as we think about fighting for the next generation, really what this has to do is, with is helping them navigate the changes that are happening to them in a way that prepares them as opposed to protecting them from the things that are happening around them. All right, and again, this might be a different message if we lived in another community, but in our community right here, we, we spend a lot of time protecting, and I want us to see that, that really one of the things we have to put our energies into is what does it mean to prepare them? Now, I think we would all agree that, that teenagers today deal with a decent amount of stress, and, and, and so it's natural for us to you know, wanna jump in and, and kind of deflect that. In fact, uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Leahy, who's a, a cognitive behavior thera therapist, he actually said something really fascinating on this. He said, the average high school student today has the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient of the early 1950s. I mean, think about that for a moment. And, and we see this lived out. We see this all around our culture. Um, you know, you look around, you see it represented. In fact, you can see it represented in art. You can see it represented in music. In fact, I want to do a deep dive for a moment in some of the music of the last decade or so because it kind of tells a story. Music has an amazing way of, of not only reflecting culture but also directing culture. And, and it kind of signals to us what's going on in the world. It's one of the reasons we do a song every single weekend from the radio, something from, from just pop culture because it, it says a lot about where our world is, but it also says about, a lot about where we're heading. And, and we just think God has a lot to say about those kinds of things. And so, you know, a lot of our music not only, you know, tells us the narrative of our culture, but it also kind of tells us what kind of messaging is going into our heads, and, and especially the heads of the younger generation. And, and we can see how it's changed over the last decade or two or three. For instance, if I go back about 12, uh, 13 years or so, um, one of the songs that, that our family really kind of gathered around when our kids really started getting into music uh, was a band called the Black Eyed Peas. Anybody like the Black Eyed Peas? Oh yeah, okay, so we got some fans. So there's a song called I've Got a Feeling, and, and you may remember this, it said, I got a feeling that tonight's gonna be a good night. My kids, we had a stage in the loft of our house and they would like do a concert every night with this song. Tonight's gonna be the night, let's live it up. I got my mom. Money, let's spend it up. I mean, what's the message of this song right here? I mean, the message is like, hey, um, life's a party, right? Life's a party, um, there's hopefulness, there's a lot of opportunity, we need to take advantage of all the things we have in front of us. Well, we, we you know, fast forward a couple years and we, we find another song that we actually covered here at Crosspoint a few years ago uh, by a band called 21 Pilots, which is a band that has a really good pulse on culture today. And, and this, this song is called Stressed Out. And I want you to look at the lyrics that, that, that they kind of wrote into reflecting what's going on in our time. They said, wish we could turn back time to the good old days when our mama sang us to sleep, but now we're stressed out. And, and if you have ever seen the, the music video to this song, it's fascinating because you've got like a 25 year old uh, young man on a big wheel, <laughs> almost like acting like he wished he was young again and he's writing to his mom's house. And you, you can see this right here, he's writing and, and he actually walks in his mom's house and it's almost like he wants to turn back the clock, almost a wishfulness to, to, back, to, to being able to go back to simpler days. In fact, here's another part of the song right here. They, they say, I was told when I get older, all my fears would shrink, but now I'm insecure and I care what people think. Which that's, that's probably social media right there. I mean, that's the reality that, man, I, everybody's you know, speaking into my life. I've got all these messages coming at me each and every day. Fast forward a couple years from that to, you know, around 2018, 19, there was a song that we see from a, a, a group by the name of Chainsmokers uh, that's called Sick Boy. And, and here's, here's some of the, the messaging that they began to reflect about our time. They said, make no mistake, I live in a prison that I built myself, it's my religion, and they say that I am the sick boy. Feed yourself through, a life, through my life's work, how many likes is my life worth? I mean, again, right there, I mean, this, this is just a reflection of, oh my gosh, like everybody's speaking into me, my life is dictated by the things that are going on around me, by, by what people think of me. I mean, just think of the roller coaster that you're on when you're, when you're like actually living in this way. 
And one of the reasons this is so important is, you know, my experience with my kids and, and just, you know, observations and working with families is that middle schoolers, high schoolers, even college students today, for, in many cases, I mean, you know, social media really is where, where much of this generation gets its identity. And, you know, for me, it was different. I mean, it may have been for you different. Maybe it was your faith. Maybe it was your family that you came from or, you know, your athlete, things you did athletically on the field or on the court. But, but this generation, I mean, it's a roller coaster that's much dictated by the messages that we receive. Let me give you one more. This, this is going super current. Um, this is a song we covered just this past fall um, from the Barbie movie and um, uh, Billie Eilish. Great movie, great song. She writes, I don't know how to feel, but I want to try. I don't know how to feel, but someday I might. When did it end, all the enjoyment? I'm sad again. Don't tell my boyfriend. It's not what he's made for. What was I made for? And so, I mean, here we see that it's like, I don't even, I'm trying to figure out like why I'm here. And then, you know, I'm dealing with things, but I don't even know that I need to tell my boyfriend. I mean, there's not people in my life that it's not their job to own that. And and see, we see all of this, and, and we just in one, you know, a little over a decade, we can see this movement from like, I'm in control, I have, you know, control over my destiny, I can actually make decisions that affect my life, to this sense of life is happening to me. And, you know, statistically, I mean, if you look at data today, I mean, the number one word that, that you know, the up-and-coming generation would use to define their life is this word right here, it's the word overwhelmed. In fact, in a recent college survey, over 80% of the students surveyed said that, that they would describe their life by this word right here, overwhelmed. In fact, one third of students said that they're so overwhelmed that it actually interrupts their ability to function normally in life and get this one out of every four students. So that means one out of every four 18 to 24 year olds in your life, my life, you know, part of our community that we interact with every single day, every, one out of every four of them over the last month at some point have seriously considered taking their own life through suicide. I mean, just because there's a sense of, of feeling overwhelmed. And I mean, and of course, this isn't cool. It's not good. I mean, this idea of life is happening to me and it's so out of control and I don't know how to interpret all of it. And, 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 and I've got all these messages coming at me. And so as a result, what happens is we tend to fall into this, what, what, we, what is called an external locus of control, which is this idea of everything around me is dictating my life, is shaping my narrative, versus an internal locus of control, which is this idea that I actually have the ability to shape my narrative. And every time we talk about the next generation, I, I like to talk about locus of control. And, and if this is a, a new term to you, let me give you a little backstory on this. Um, this is something that came from a guy, a, a guy by the name of Dr. Julian Rotter. And he did some research back in the 50s and basically came up with an assessment to determine where the locus of control is within each individual. Meaning, if you're someone who has an external locus of control, this is someone who believes that fate or external forces, I mean, whatever's going on around me, that dictates my life. I mean, I'm just gonna kinda, I, I don't really have control of the narrative of my life. I just kinda blow with whatever the winds of culture you know, bring my way. Versus someone who has an internal locus of control is somebody who believes that they actually own their own success and accomplishments. That I I actually can choose the narrative to my life. And so back in 1963, when he began researching this, one of the things Dr. Dr. Rotter saw was that the, the students that had an internal locus of control, like I actually have control over my future, I can do things that actually, actually dictate you know, how my life goes, these students were actually, actually measurably more successful than students who had an external locus of control meaning they took better care of their bodies, they took better care of their health, they took better care of their relationships, they had better marriages, they're more successful in their jobs. And, and the concerning part, you know, in, in some of his data, all the way back to when he first started, they started collecting data on this, is that they began to see this slow and steady decline of this internal locus of control, or agency as you might call it. This sense that I actually do have the ability to dictate the direction of my life. But for many students, it's like, oh, I don't know how to do this and it's out of control and I need somebody to do this for me. I don't know where to start. And why do you think that is? Well, one of the reasons that researchers, you know, bring this up and, and, and why this is so important is because as parents, you know, any of us that are parents, we actually create this. We've actually, you know, in many cases done too much for our kids, too much protecting and not enough preparing. 
In fact, there was a school in Arkansas that um, had a sign on their, on their door uh, that I just, I just think every school should have on their door, you know, as you get ready to go in the office. And, and it was specifically for parents. And I, before I show this to you, I'm gonna tell you, I've been guilty of this. Like I've had to make some shifts off this and it's one of the areas of growth for me. But here, here's what the sign said. It said, stop. So this was for parents, stop. If you're dropping off your son's forgotten lunch, books, homework, equipment, et cetera, please turn around and exit the building. All right, your son will learn to problem solve in your absence. See, this is, this is actually where like the, 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 the problem solving, the, the, the internal locus control gets developed when all of a sudden life doesn't go exactly the way I want and I have to actually come up with solutions. But see, so many of our students don't know how to do this. Why is that? Because we, we do too much protecting and not enough preparing. So again, big idea this weekend. I, I, want us to, I want us to lean into what does it look like for us to fight for the next generation by doing more preparing and less protecting. All right, because this is what develops agency. This is what develops this internal locus of control. Now, th this phrase, internal locus control, external locus control, it's not a term we use every day, um, but we have a role to play in this. And it's consistent with what we see in men and women all the way back to the first century, all the way back to the early church. To, to the first century church, we see, we see you know, the challenges, the obstacles that people in the first century face. I mean, they, they did it without Advil and Tylenol. I don't know how they did it. Um, you know, we have different challenges today, but, but they had challenges to overcome. And, and the writers of the New Testament, you know, they, they would encourage people to say, of course, there's a God. I mean, there's a God who's there. He's in control of the world. He cares for you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He knows what you need. But, but at the same time, you have the ability to control your destiny. You have the ability to control outcomes in your life. You have the ability to actually shape the direction of your life. You, know, you have an ability to shape the beliefs that you have, the hopes that you have. You have the ability actually, it's actually in you. And, and, and when we receive God into our life, I mean, we actually have God's spirit dwelling in us. I mean, think about this. The, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is actually living in us. And, and so that means you can actually do hard things. And so I wanna give us a picture, just a, a, a one verse picture of kind of what we see the Apostle Paul lay out in uh, one of his letters to the Romans. The Apostle Paul's, you know, a guy that is trying to raise up new Christians, young Christians, strengthen people who are trying to figure out what it means to have faith. And so he writes this letter to all these, these people scattered across Rome who are trying to figure this out. And here's what he says. He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, all right? And so that's, that's the external locus of control right there. Don't, don't conform to the winds that blow your way and all the different changes that happen. Don't, 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 don't find yourself going, oh my gosh, these things all dictate my life. They don't have to dictate your life. He's saying, you don't have to conform to that, but instead be transformed. And look at this phrase he uses at the end of this, by the renewing of your mind. And what he's meaning right here is he's saying, you and I actually have the opportunity to establish control of the narrative, all right? That we have the ability to make decisions each and every day, regardless of the winds that are blowing around us, that actually allow us to choose our attitude, that affect our attitude, that affect the quality of our life. And, and, and again, this is also known as agency. And so for the rest of our time today, I, I wanna give us some walkouts in how we do this. How do we implement these things in the next generation? And I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm, I'm still learning alongside you on this. These are some things I've learned and that I found super helpful. Um, and many of these I've learned from other people as well. And so I wanna kind of give you a, a, what it looks like to change the report card in, in how we parent. What does it look like when we begin putting more time and energy into preparing instead of just protecting? All right, and so you guys ready? You ready to look at what some of these things are? All right, here we go. Let's do this. So the first thing we have to do is we have to teach our kids to affirm God's promises about themselves. We have to teach our, the upcoming generation what it means to affirm God's promises about themselves. And, and I would even recommend out loud, you know, to say these things out loud. You know, and, and it sounds like hocus pocus. It sounds like, oh, we're just going through a rhythm. No, it's not that at all. We, when, we, when we say these things, we're actually fighting against the cognitive distortions that want to, to change the narrative about ourselves, that I'm gonna flunk this class. I'm not gonna do well here. I don't have any value to bring. I'm not good enough for him. I'm not good enough for her. But see, when we affirm God's promises about ourselves out loud, one of the things we do is we actually expel or we, we come against the lies that actually, that actually you know, cause us to think that everything around us shapes who we are. Now, let's, let's go back to what the Apostle Paul said right here in Romans chapter 12 for a second. Now, if you, um, if you by the way, 
subscribe or check in on the YouVersion Bible app each week, um, then you perhaps saw this verse this week. I wanna break this out. Um, if you don't, man, I, I would really encourage you to consider the YouVersion Bible app. It's a great way. The verse of the day is a great way to just, you know, like every day have something coming into your, your device that kind of sh- helps you understand God's character. And this past week, Levi Lusco, one of my favorite authors, he actually broke Romans 12 down for us right here. And, and he talked about the things that actually shape our narratives, that we allow to shape our narratives. And, and he said, it, it's all these simple things that we say. He said, we'll say things like, well, that's just the story of my life. You know, maybe you go through something and it doesn't go the way that you want. And you go, wow, that's just the story of my life. It always goes that way. You know, the, the bottom of your grocery bag fell out or you spilled coffee all over your shirt right before you walked into a presentation. Like, wow, it's just the story of my life. It always goes this way. And, and, and basically, you know, w- whenever we say that, what we're actually saying is that, that, that this is our narrative. And what, what Paul's saying, and even what Levi Lusco was trying to help us understand this week, is that we actually can choose the narrative right there. He's saying you can actually articulate a better story. But to do that, we have to learn to think differently. We have to renew our mind. We have to renew our mind based on what God says about us. And so when we see or experience something bad that happens, and we say, well, this is the story of my life, that actually is negative thinking. And, and, and we can't live right if we don't think right. And so ultimately, when we allow a thought like that to actually make its way into our, na- into our vernacular, then we're actually a lot closer to that bad thought coming true than we were previously, because our thinking affects our behavior. And so one of the things we have to do is we have to tell ourselves, we have to teach our kids, and we have to teach those that we're raising up what it, what it means to lean into the promises that God says about them, that I am loved, that I am cherished. Even when things don't go my way, guess what? I, I'm, I'm valued. I'm a beloved child of God. Now, I want to show you one of my absolute favorite all-time videos of, of what this looks like. And, and this is a dad who's actually walking this out with his young daughter. Take a look at this right here. Look at yourself. Look in your eyes. You got to see it, okay? You got to feel it. You ready? You ready for school? Yeah. Is it going to be a good day? Mm-hmm. A really good day? You going to be positive? Say, I am strong. I am strong. Say, I am smart. I am smart. Say, I work hard. I work hard. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am respectful. I am respectful. Yeah. Say, I'm not better than anyone. I'm not better than anyone. Nobody's better than me. No one's better than me. I am amazing. I am amazing. I am great. I am great. What's your name? Aaliyah Austin. If you fall? I get back up. What are you? Unless. Yes. Come on, how amazing is that? Oh my word, that is so, so good right there. You know, th- these are actually called preferred affirmations. That's what this is called. And, and this is what successful people do. They actually tell themselves daily what they are and, and even what they're not. In fact, uh, I, I say things out loud sometimes. Uh, when I get up, I'll say things like, hey, you are Kurt, you are awesome, you look good today, and by God, people are gonna like you today. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> Actually, I do tell myself that sometimes. Actually, I have a preferred list that I do actually write and spend a lot of time on. In fact, I'm going to show them to you. They're a little corny. They're, they're very personal to me. But this is, this is actually some of the things I tell myself every day. I'm here on purpose. I can do hard things. God has good plans for me. There's an intelligent darkness out there that wants to actually discourage me. But I am a child of God. Those are five things that, that on, on pretty regular repeat, when I'm in my quiet time, I remind myself on to reset my narrative. Now, he, here's why this is important. Why, why saying these out loud? Why, why modeling this? Why, why, why helping our, our, our kids, the next generation, those we're leading, those we're raising up? Why it's so important? It's not magic. It's not like rubbing a genie and these things just happen. The, these set a tone for our life. And these are all basically um, connected to some basic truth or promise about who, how God sees us. So let me go through them again. I'm here on purpose. This is based on Psalm 139, where God says, hey, I knit you together. Before you even breathed the breath, I had a purpose for you. I can do hard things. Paul Paul tells us that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. God has good plans for me. This is based on Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet who says, hey, God has good plans and plans for, for a hope and a good future. 
There's an intelligent darkness that's gonna try to discourage me. I mean, that, that's just being honest. I mean, Jesus was very clear. Hey, there's a, there's a battle going on in the heavenlies and, and there's a thief that wants to steal, kill, and destroy from you. But you know, I'm a child of God and that power actually overcomes all of their powers. In fact, the gospel writer John said to all who believe and receive the name of Jesus that you actually can claim the name beloved child of God. See, when, when we live out of these, I'm telling you, there's something powerful that, that is, is set in our narrative. And in a world where, you know, our, our up and coming generation is faced with all kinds of messages, we have to help them live out of these, these true beliefs about themselves. Dr. Elmore, uh, he, he has a, a whole series of books called Habitudes. I'm gonna show you a few pictures out of them here in just a moment. And, and I'm mentioning this because if you're a, a, a uh, educator, if you're in administration with education, if you are a coach, if you do anything with socio-emotional learning and you are helping build some of these skills into students, you might wanna go to the Growing Leaders um, blog page and actually check some of these resources out because they help us land some of these concepts. And so as we think of this idea of how do I, I speak belief and, and things that are true and help the next generation to do the same, I wanna give you an image, um, two images that are very similar. It's the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer. Now, as you think about these two images, both of these things have to do with temperature, but they have a very, very different function. You know, a, a thermometer literally just like identifies the temperature in the room, whereas a thermostat sets the temperature in the room. I want my kids to, to set the temperature in the room. I, mean, I want them to be the ones that say, hey, I actually can choose to have a positive influence in the world. I can choose what my narrative looks like. In fact, uh, one of my daughters, I, I was in her room this past week, which I'm in there frequently, but I noticed so she has all these little sayings she puts on her wall. And uh, here, here you go, it's right here. And, and I was reading some of them, I snapshotted a few of them, and I wanna share them with you because I love these. These are the things that she looks at every day and it sets her narrative. In fact, this one right here, uh, this first one, it says, um, be the energy that you wanna attract. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I love that that's how you're starting your day, looking up from your bed, be the energy you want to attract, be the thing that you want to experience today. And, and then she has another one that says, um, you know, stop and pet the dog, because, um, you know, that just makes your day better too. And she wants to make sure she does that. But, but these things set a course for our day. Now, if you're saying, okay, how do I build this into my students? How do I, how do I develop this? Um, uh, Tim Elmore actually just recently came out with a, a fantastic new book called I Can't Wait. And, and I wanna encourage you, if you've got young children, even all the way up through like junior high, um, I can't wait. Yeah, I love the junior hires here today. Um, 52 stories of kids who changed their world that you can read together. So, so stories of, of real life stories of students who actually saw the world and instead of being dictated by the things going on in the world, say, hey, I can actually influence the world. And then a whole set of questions that you can talk about about what does it look like for us to be that kind of change agent in our world? We're actually giving agency to our students. We're building an internal locus of control and we're helping them see that they can actually set their identity. All right, these are available at Connection Point. Uh, you can check them out after service. Um, second thing, second thing we, can, we have to do is we have to help students see progress. We have to help students see progress, not perfection, not perfection. There's a guy by the name of Martin Seligman and back in the 1960s, he started studying something called learned helplessness. And, and here's how he defined learned helplessness. helplessness. This is basically st when students begin to act helpless is when they are hopeless. And he was, you know, just observing students and it, just like you're in my life, I mean, when you put energy into something and you begin to, you know, see that the things that you're doing aren't having any affect and you just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, and you're not seeing any results, at some point you give up. I mean, it's like the rat in the experiment that, that triggers the lever and expects a treat and no treat comes out. And they hit the lever again and nothing comes out. And they hit the lever again, nothing comes out. At some point, they're like, okay, I'm gonna stop hitting the lever. I mean, it's helpless, all right? And they feel hopeless as a result of this. And so, you know, basically we learn hopelessness. A lot of times our students learn hopelessness, again, because as parents, as, as people who are raising this generation, we spend too much time protecting them instead of preparing them, giving them opportunities to actually grow and to see what kind of progress they can make. 
One of the things my wife and I have done um, with all of our kids, and I'm gonna, I'm, as I tell you some of these stories, I'm gonna tell you, we, we've made more mistakes than you'll ever know. You're gonna hear some of our good ones and a few of our bad ones. Um, but we, we just started having our kids do their own laundry from like a very early age, which unfortunately meant for like my youngest daughter, like she started like first grade. Like it's pretty much like, hey, if you need clothes, you're gonna have to learn how to, you know, wash them. And we, we'd show them and we'd, you know, talk them through. And, and, you know, the cool thing is by the time that they got to fax class in junior high, which is family and consumer science, Sciences. That's like home ec for some of us, like back in the day. Um, they'd already done the curriculum. They're like, hey, go figure out, you know, here's how you do laundry. Go home and do a batch. They're like, oh, I do that every day. Now, you know, it, it wasn't, it, there were some dicey moments. I mean, we, we've, there, there were some ruined clothes. Um, there, there were moments where they wouldn't actually do their laundry. And so we'd be getting ready for school the next day. And they'd be like, I don't have any clothes. And so they had to put on like dirty pants and maybe a shirt that didn't go with it. And a few times, I remember Julie and I watched him come home, and I'm like, I pretty much think the teachers think they're homeless. <laughs> I mean, they're probably like, where are the parents? Well, you know where the parents were. We were actually less concerned with our kids' fashion ability at school. We were more interested in raising adult, you know, future adults. And, you know, that, that was kind of our goal. And, you know, today, I mean, the result, we're two for two so far of kids going to college. And when they got to their first week, they weren't standing there crying in front of the washing machine because they didn't know what to do. In fact, um, I don't know if you are familiar with the name Liz Murray. Uh, she's the homeless to Harvard girl. Um, there's a book called Breaking Night where that kind of chronicles her life where she grew up in New York City and her parents were addicts and she grew up on the streets and yet she was incredibly intelligent. She won a scholarship to Harvard. And in her book, she tells a story about how during her freshman year of college, she was standing in front of the washer and dryer in the dorm alongside one of her classmates and both of them are standing there crying. And, and yet for two different reasons. For her, she was crying because she'd never in her life had access to a washer and dryer. And for her classmate who came from a much more privileged experience, she'd never ever used a washer and dryer. And, and so when you begin to act helpless, you find yourself hopeless. Now in response to this is another psychologist that um, developed something called learned industrialness. And this is a game changer because learned industrialness is when students see even the smallest amount of progress. This is why helping students see progress is so important. When they see the smallest amount of progress, they begin to exert more effort. Now, I saw this with my daughter uh, this past fall. Um, we were out playing top golf one day as a family right before school started. And, 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 and my youngest daughter is a softball player and she's up there just smacking the ball. And I'm like, I'm like dang, she could, like, she could like play golf if she wanted to. And, and we'd never really pursued it. So I just said to her after, you know, after when we were leaving, I said, hey, do you have any interest trying out for the golf team? And she's like, well, maybe. And she's like, I've never played. I'm like, I know, but like, I just, I think you could actually develop, you know, a, you could become really good. And so, um, you know, golf tryouts were like a week. So like we hit the driving range a couple of times. She decided she wanted to give it a shot. We went out and played, I think two rounds of golf before she tried out. And uh, in one of our rounds, I'll never forget, she's standing on the, on the tee. She hits the ball so far. And, and I'm just like standing there in awe. And, and I'm, like, I'm like, Meredith, that was amazing. She's like, yeah, but it's like, it's like two fairways over. That was horrible. She rolls her eyes, puts her head down in the typical, like, what, I, I call that like a typical seventh grade response. Like, oh gosh, I'm, gonna, you know, I'm not any good at this. And I said, whoa, wait a second. I, I know you're like way over here, but understand, like, you, you keep playing every day. I mean, you, you, you will be able to, to to, to get really good at golf if you put time into this. I mean, you've got a swing that, that is natural for this sport. And that was all she needed to see is that actually that hit, while it wasn't perfect, she actually could build on that. And man, she went to work. And I, I think it was like four or five weeks later, she had like three pars in a row in a golf match. How about that? Just because she could see, it's called learned industrialness. All, all we need to see is just a little growth and it motivates us to move forward. She needed to see the process. Here's the image I want you to think about on this. Candles and brush fires, two flames. Now, now candles and brush fires come from a similar source, but there's a huge, huge difference. I mean, with a candle, it just takes a whew, and that, that flame is extinguished. Whereas, what, what does a bit of wind do for a brush fire? I mean, it, it like builds intensity, right? It builds intensity. And so we have to ask the question, you know, as we're raising the next generation, are we, are we building candles or are we building brush fires? 
We, we do that by helping students see progress. We build, we, we build intensity by helping them see progress. Third thing, third thing, we have to give them ownership. We change the report card by giving them ownership. And, and this is a season Julie and I are in. I mean, as our kids get older, we're, we're turning less into someone who is a supervisor and, and we're more and more into coaching and supporting and consulting. And, and it means we have to lead differently. And, and the image I want to give us on this, the, the image I want us to think about, it, it's in one image. There's two different types of people in this one image. And this is, uh, this is the difference between drivers and passengers right here. Drivers and passengers. All right, now I want you to think about this for a moment. There's an big difference between people who are passengers and drivers. In fact, my 17-year-old, we went to the mall the other day together, and she just jumped in the car with me, and as we were driving through the neighborhood, she can drive now. She said, you know, Dad, every time I get in the car and ride with you, I feel like I'm a little girl again. And and we were like reminiscing, and and, and then I began to realize, oh my gosh, like I, because I'm always the one driving whenever we're together, it naturally puts her in a posture of being a passenger. You know what do passengers do? You get in the car, you put your AirPods in, you you know, wave to your friends when they're going by, having a good time, I and mean, pay attention to everything around. What, what do drivers do? Drivers, you know, when you're the driver, like it's your responsibility to get to the destination, right? And yet too often, I think, as parents, we find ourselves just maybe even indirectly encouraging our kids to be passengers instead of drivers. And, and so this is about owning the destination because you can't blame anybody when you get to where you are because you're the one that helped get yourself there. And when you do this, you actually grow agency, you grow internal locus of control. So how do you do this? Well, one of the things you have to do is you have to get okay with your own insecurities, with not being the one in charge. A couple years ago, I learned this from one of my good friends. Um, I had the chance to coach a bunch of sixth grade girls in rec basketball and met a bunch of amazing people. Uh, it was one of the best teams I'd ever coached. And, and uh, one of the, the parents was like, hey, you know, you did, we won the championship that year. And they're like, you know, you didn't do that. Like these girls pretty much had the championship when they stepped on the floor. I'm like, I know, it, just, it was a privilege to coach them. But I got to meet a lot of fun people. I got to meet my good friend, Scott Long. Some of you know Scott Long, a comedian in the area that we've had the chance to partner with here in benefits and sponsoring great initiatives in our community. And um, another guy, that, that assistant coach, coached with me, a guy by the name of Derek Freeman. And Derek, again, has become a really good friend and uh, is a part of our community here at Cross Point. And uh, Derek taught me something. A uh, couple weeks into the season, I was coaching, Derek was assisting me. I had no idea what an amazing coach he was. He's the kind of guy, when you meet him, you know, he's a very humble guy, amazing dad, amazing coach. His son is probably, uh, you know, one of the best athletes that's ever graduated from Hanover Southeastern High School, went on to play for the University of Nebraska, had a promising NFL career in his future until he had a career-ending spinal injury. And, and his son just walked away and said, okay, you know, I'm not gonna do football. I'm gonna, you know, go do my career that I prepared for. I'm like, how do you raise a kid like that? that prepares their whole life and then just has the confidence to walk away and and do something that they're built built for. Well, Derek raised him up. And so it was our second or third game of the season and I had to be away for the weekend. And so I said, hey, Derek, I'm gonna be out of town. Would you mind coaching this weekend? Matt, my son, was coaching with us. I said, Matt, I'll be here to help. And he said, no, I'm actually not gonna coach. Um, He said, Matt's gonna coach. He said, I'm gonna assist Matt. I'm like, oh, (laughs) I hadn't even thought about that. So I looked at Matt, and Matt was kind of like, whoa, he's about 16, 17 at the time. And I said, you up for coaching these girls, Matt? And he said, yeah, I can do that. So he put the plan together. He put the rotations together. And I'll be honest with you, I don't even remember if we won or lost the game. We probably won because I mean, we had an amazing team, and I think we won about every game. But I can tell you that my son grew about six inches that weekend because Derek put him in the driver's seat instead of delegating him to the passenger seat. You see, this is, these are the ways we change the report card. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, many people in our community aren't doing this. This is not a normal thing in, in our community. But I'm telling you, these are game changers. In fact, I want you to take a look at some of your next steps that are on your connection card as we wrap up. And I just want to encourage you to consider what, what's, one, what's one next step in, in one of these areas. You might say, you know, this is something God's putting on my heart in my role as I shape the next generation, as I shape the the students that are in my home, as I shape, you know, the students in my workplace, in my school. What, what's God putting on my heart? Because I believe this is what it means to fight for the next generation. And I know for some of us, we're sitting here and um, we're aware that 
perhaps that day has come and gone and, and maybe you're sitting there with a bit of regret and you're like, gosh, I wish I could have done some of this. I feel like, man, I made so many mistakes. Listen, I, 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 none of us are great parents. Um, one, one of the amazing things is every day is a new day. And, and the God I know actually specializes in work in the graveyard where things are seemingly dead and you know, he has the ability to bring things that look like they have no hope back to life. And so perhaps uh, it's not too late. You know, it's never too late to start building these things into those that we're raising. And so I wanna pray for us. I, I wanna invite you to stand, I wanna pray for us. And, and I just wanna ask God to uniquely, you know, put on your heart. So let's go ahead and stand and, uh, and just ask God to say, God, what, what, what do you want me to do? What's my role as we, as we fight for this next generation? God, thank you for um, these pictures. Uh, thank you for the words from Paul. And, God, I just pray that you help us to know what to do with what we've heard and the things you've been stirring in our hearts. And um, you know the things that are weighing us down right now. You know the challenges that the students, that uh, the young people that we're raising, that we're influencing, whether that's in our homes or in our workplaces or in our schools, you, you know the challenges that come with that. And yet we, we know you're a God who works beyond those things. So God, whatever we need right now, whatever the desires of our heart, are as we think about how we can better build into this generation. God, I just pray that, that your spirit would move. I pray that you would do the work that only you can do. And, and I just pray that your spirit would empower us. God, as, as we open ourselves up to what you want to do, the change you want to create, God, I just pray that, you, that we'd be open to, to what that looks like. And we want to follow your lead. Thanks so much for joining us today. Take a moment to follow our podcast on your preferred platform and be sure to download our app to stay informed on everything happening here at Crosspoint. And if you like what you heard today, don't hesitate to share it with a friend that might need to hear it too.